Hello, World Wide Web. I'm Dega Shadow, the internet personality with the best dreams. And I assure you, I've been getting plenty of sleep during... The Summer of Freddy vs. Jason! And it's time for A Nightmare on Elm Street Part 4, The Dream Master. Produced in a way closer to Freddy's Revenge than Dream Warriors, The Dream Master was released only one year after the previous movie, and Wes Craven wasn't interested in working on it. That's not to say it's another wild offshoot in a completely different direction, though, as it actually picks up the story right where the last one left off, with many of the same characters. I mean, so despite the different writers and directors this time around, it actually feels a little closer to A Nightmare on Elm Street than it could have. All that, and the writers weren't trying to insert edgy subtext into it. This time we see there's a different kind of dream power one may have. A means to combine powers in the dream world Captain Planet style, which can make you the Dream Master. Or it's less Captain Planet and more Avatar The Last Airbender. Or maybe it has nothing to do with any of that and it's just another movie about killing teenagers. But either way, let's take a look at A Nightmare on Elm Street Part 4, The Dream Master, and get to the bottom of this. We open to the terror of sidewalk chalk. This actually being very scary, considering it's of the iconic Elm Street house, and being made by one of those creepy damn kids, who Kristen questions. Hello. Do you live here? Nobody lives here. Everyone dies here! Also, as you might have noticed, Kristen is now played by a completely different actress, Tuesday Night. That's K-N-I-G-H-T, Night. A.K.A. my parents were assholes. Point is, a storm suddenly comes up, and she must take shelter in the only house on the street with holes in the roof. Also, the walls don't look particularly stable, but the biggest problem is the exploding windows. Blasting her so hard, it knocks her into a completely different movie series and summer special, Hellraiser or into the boiler room, now with extra hanging chains. This freaks her out enough that she uses her dream power to call out Joey and Kincaid for help. It's a hell of a lot less subtle this time around. At least the two of them are still played by the same actors, Ken Sagos and Rodney Eastman. Neither of them are particularly happy to be here or concerned about the situation. It seems Kristen has sucked them into her dreams quite a lot lately, and at no time have they ever ran back into Freddy Krueger. However, that's not to say they're completely safe, as suddenly, she is attacked by Jason! <laughs> the dog's name is Jason. Or, the, the dog's name is Jake, but he, he plays Jason. As this is the Elm Street franchise, the bite has injured Kristen directly, but that's no reason to hold off introducing the new characters for this tale, such as Alice, played by Lisa Wilcox, and her father, played by Nicholas Mel. You going out dressed like that? What's wrong with me this time? Good question. She's about as modestly dressed as they come, especially in the 80s, the era of short skirts, leather jackets, and big hair. All right. Anybody have trig this semester? What happened? Like that! What's... was that previous scene scripted for you? She's a friend with Alice, and we're also introduced to Alice's brother Rick, played by Andras Jones. Also, there's the hot guy in school, Dan, played by Dan Hassel, whom Alice has the hots for. You know, you are one major league hunk. <laughs> Thanks, Alice. Earth to Alice. But she is cursed with daydreaming and social awkwardness. Kind of a Alice in Wonderlandy. Last but not least, we have Sheila, played by Toy Newkirk. Also, they quickly establish some character traits and how they're going to die. How can you ride this health hazard? You know, it's no wonder that you have asthma. No, you see, asthma is an inherited condition. Read a book now and then you might know something. Ew! 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 It's so disgusting! Hey, hey, Supergirl, it's dead. Give a bug a break. Asthma is common enough that while most people don't have it, you probably at least know someone out there who does, so it doesn't need too much explanation, but... Uh, how exactly is being distasteful of bugs a unique feature? I mean, personally, when I was scripting this line, a fucking roach crawled on my foot, and I don't think it was particularly unique of me when I came out with my sentiment of GET THE FUCK OFF ME! Back on the plot, Kincaid and Joey meet back up with Kristen to tell her to stop doing that. Also, Joey can talk now. Like, when awake, 
No time to explain that, as there's something else Kristen wants answered. Then what about this? That don't mean dick. My dog is like me. Drag him into your crazy dream and he gets wild. So that was Kincaid's dick in the last movie. At the end of the conversation, those who know Freddy is real ignore Kristen's concerns, and the new characters just think all this talk of the supernatural is silly. Nevertheless, Kristen's new boyfriend, Rick, has to get some character development out of the way. He has a hobby where he dabbles in musical montages. Rather, he's a martial artist with some decent mental discipline, but it still strikes me as odd to teleport to the Karate Kid without knowing what the hell he's training for. Nevertheless, this ends when Alice's father comes home after working late, the kind of work where they hand out liquor bottles in paper bags, leaving him surly and unappreciative of the meal his daughter has prepared for him. Christ, Alice, try to think a little more. I can think of how sick I am of watching you drink your life away and taking it out on me. Okay, so uh, which one of them has been getting shit face drunk all day? Alice, I'm talking to you. Are you awake or what? Ah, it's another daydream. It's a shame it was going so well, too. So we're going to have to rely on another character to get the plot moving along, Kincaid, as he lays himself down to rest, only to be interrupted when a mysterious figure begins coming through the door. <laughs> Jason. Come on, boy. Come on. Come on. That's a boy. You almost scared me, boy. How the hell did you learn to turn a doorknob? It's not the scariest thing Jason knows how to do, as that night, Kincaid finds himself trapped in a nightmare. Or, more specifically, the trunk of a car. The very car that Freddy's bones are hidden away in for so long. And with both Kincaid and Jason here, Jason lets loose. Imagine trying to explain that one to the vet. It burns when he pees. How do you know that? I have my ways. The petrol piss makes revealing the remains remarkably easy, as it splits the ground open, and we get to see Freddy do a Hellraiser-esque reconstitution, pulling himself out of the grave he was placed in, ready to kill again. You shouldn't have buried me. I'm not dead. Yeah, you are. Your origin story is how you died. You're dead. That's how it works. Best I can figure for how this works plot-wise is that the Hellhound-style dog piss desecrated the grave, allowing his resurrection, and perhaps even in his defeated state he had just enough energy from Kristen's fear to influence a dog. No matter the case, this isn't good news for Kincaid. Tell him Freddy sent you. Ugh. Ugh. Uh, hi, uh, Freddy sent me. Oh, good. Then you're gonna want to be taking the express elevator to hell, right down that way. Thanks. <laughs> Kristen, of course, is too wound up to sleep that night, but Joey seems relaxed enough, reclining on his waterbed and watching MTV. However, he's the first person to find out what horrible fate awaits this network! No, 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 the titties are just a distraction. The problem is... How's this for a wet dream? <laughs> cut from one subject to the next so quickly with no explanation, and before you know it, you got kids everywhere saying that breathing oxygen is an oppressive stereotype. So in a kill that feels a little bit like a throwback to Johnny Depp in the original movie, Joey is dragged into his bed, along with his electronics, and bled dry. Oh well, now that that's taken care of, we can establish a few more traits for the obviously important Alice. As Rick points out, she has so many pictures on her mirror, she can't even see herself in it, and then proceeds to show us that she doesn't have the same enthusiasm for martial arts that he does. Get up there and just, just, hey! like that, big and strong. Do it. Sorry! She can't kick well. <laughs> That's not, not really a problem. It's not like she's supposed to know how to do that, unlike Kristen and smoking. And if the actress doesn't want to do it, that's fine, but this is the point where you get creative with the camera angles. Or get some stunt lungs. It seems that Kristen is concerned considering she hasn't seen Joey or Kincaid yet today. First, we gotta establish a weird quirk some more, though. We have matching luggage again. The bags under your eyes. 
Nightmares? Yeah. God, I hate dreaming. You know, they established those drugs to keep you from dreaming in the last movie, and you had some, yet ever think about maybe renewing your prescription? Alice mentions something about a Dream Master childhood rhyme, but can't remember it right now. Besides, you just have to dream of fun stuff, and that'll prevent any nightmare. So everything's going to be fine. Okay, Joey. No. The horror. Men have started going to the bathroom in pairs, too! No! One extremely awkward and hard to explain conk on the noggin later, and Kristen is knocked out cold. When she comes to, she finds out she's in the nurse's office with the school nurse, played by Robert Englund. Wait a minute. I want to draw some blood. No! <laughs> no! Ah, never mind. She's played by Joanna Lipari, which means that she has a PhD in psychology. It's making this awfully damn convenient. With that, we move on and never bring her up again. Besides, it's time to go to the local diner, the Crave Inn, and learn that pretty much every student at our school either works here or eats here, as Dan comes in looking for Alice's brother, Rick, who isn't quite here yet, so he'll just take a seat. Sorry, Alice. Your shift's over. My table now. Oh, no. I'm off the clock, and I can't possibly just go over there and make small talk with the guy I like. Damn co-workers taking away my potential responsibilities! When Kristen does finally make it, the rest of the characters learn the truth that Joey and Kincaid didn't come to school because they both died in their sleep. Joey winding up inside his waterbed somehow. Kristen doesn't know where to turn, so she gathers everyone together to go directly to the Elm Street house. So, uh, why the haunted house? It's not just a house. It's his home. Call home base to paint your home today. But, uh, some people think that this line signifies that this house was actually Freddy Krueger's house before Nancy's family killed him, and then moved in to the child killer's house. To save money? Though, I don't think that that's really what she meant by the line. I think that Krueger's spirit is tied to this house because Nancy's mother kept the glove and hid it away in there. At least that's what makes sense to me. The guys go in to investigate the, uh, porch, while summarizing the story of Freddy Krueger for the audience and new cast members. While this is going on, Alice has a revelation. Now I lay me down to sleep, the master of dreams my soul I'll keep. The dream master, I think I remember the rhyme. The rhyme you're having such a hard time remembering is a parody of one of the most common bedtime prayers in the country. Uh, okay, well how's the rest go? Kristen, get the hell away from that house! It kind of goes off the rails a bit. No wonder she's had such a hard time remembering it. This means not only does Alice completely forget the rhyme she just remembered, but Kristen can't deal with the Freddy problem just yet, being shooed away. Also, Alice daydreams the sidewalk chalk back into existence, but that's not important. What is a big deal is that Kristen's mother has slipped a little something in her drink. Oh, God. Come on, what did you do? Oh, Kristen. Cheese and sleeping pills? I would have been much more impressed if she just drove down there with a rifle and just went poof, hit her with a tranquilizer. But you gotta sleep. So Kristen's plan to just stay awake forever in fear of Freddy, despite the fact that without sleep you die in two weeks to a month, doesn't work out, but since she fears the kind of death that sleep brings in this franchise, she remembers Alice's advice about taking control and dreaming of somewhere happy! Okay, so you're on the beach. Could you maybe start to explain how in the hell it's supposed to prevent you from running into Freddy Krueger? That does mean he had to be creative. He is very creative, so this was a terrible strategy, but fun. Trapping her in a hell of slow-mo surprise quicksand, Freddy catches up and stomps Kristen down into the doghouse. Here we find that as she's the last Elm Street kid, she's the last one he has a connection with. But her dream power to summon others into the dream world would come in very handy for Kruger's soul-collecting hobby. Why don't you reach out and cut someone? No! See, now I'm gonna start getting confused with all these dream power things. Before it was just you go to sleep, Freddy comes and he kills you. Now you got the fucking super strength and the teleportation and bringing people into dreams and shit. And now I'm thinking that as this movie goes on, it's starting to start looking like Dragon Ball Z. 
In her fear, Kristen accidentally summons Alice into her dream, meaning now she is connected to Kruger. After being tossed into the lake of fire, Kristen refuses to give her soul up to Kruger, instead blasting straight through the man and into Alice. <laughs> So Kristen had three dream powers. She, she had the parkour, the group invite, and now soul hopping. Okay. It, it, it's convenient, but I guess it works. Realizing Kristen's in trouble, Alice rushes to her aid, even though she already saw a Kruger killer in the dream world, which means her fate shouldn't be all that surprising. The dark side of what can go wrong when lighting a fart. So Kristen is very dead, and Alice, having seen Freddy, is pretty well convinced he's at fault. Her brother, however, doesn't believe this supernatural explanation for a second, and refuses to help her plot anything against some dream world monster whatever. This means she just has to deal with the stress the old-fashioned way. I don't smoke. And what the hell are you doing with cigarettes? They don't materialize in your pocket when you feel the need for a hit. Hello. Many smokers around the world would probably really like that if it was the case. And besides, Kristen wasn't really a smoker either. In order for people to care about all the murder and death going on, we're gonna need a little more than three bodies. So cue the boring-ass class, where Alice can drift off to sleep. Yeah, she daydreams, but she just falls asleep here, inadvertently pulling Sheila into her dream with her. Either B9's trying to cop a feel, Johnny Five is alive, and this bitch is dead. Whatever the hell a robot arm of death was summoned for, it is no longer needed and leaves the movie entirely, because this is Freddy's show, and nobody's going to be satisfied unless he goes in uncomfortably close for the kill. Wanna suck the face? No. You flunked. So is there a reason that Kruger has to kill people in a way that looks natural now? I mean, in the first movie, he grabbed Tina, dragged her up and down the walls and cut her open, blood everywhere, spurred through her! Here, and he's like, ah, oh, she's got asthma. Mm, you know, I can work with that. Because of this, nobody else in class questions Sheila's death as anything but a tragic fate due to her condition. Not sure if Freddy's afraid of exorcists or what, but at least now Rick does figure out that there's enough corpses that maybe his sister is onto something, and he should actually listen to her about this. So that's one person on her side, which calls for another boring class leading to Alice drifting off to sleep again, and pulling him into this nightmare, sending him down an express elevator to hell, which, well, leads here. They say it was planned that the thing would fall apart and he'd die by falling into a black void, but the shot was too expensive, so instead he winds up in a battle against the Invisa Kruger, utilizing his Karate Kid Jedi powers to fight the formless foe back. How are you gonna fight me without your weapon, Freddy? Whoa, 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 movie, movie. She just woke up. She's in the real world now. What the fuck made the windows explode? They don't explain it. Instead, we just fade straight to Rick's funeral, where we see Alice is devastated by the loss of her brother. Hello, baby. She makes up for it by being batshit insane, so it's all good. Obviously, this is another one of her daydreams. Uh, don't worry about Freddy showing up, he seems to have a thing against daydreams. Matter of fact, she never daydreams again for the rest of the movie, so it wasn't really relevant to the plot in the slightest. On the plus side, Alice's surviving friends actually believe maybe the whole Kruger thing is worth talking about now, because dying kinda sucks. Also, as Alice removes more dead friend pictures from her mirror, she suddenly gets a tick to play with some of her dead brother's belongings. happening to me. Character development. It's fucking awesome. Alice figures her and her friends should all meet up at Debbie's place to figure out how to defeat Kruger, but thanks to Alice's father, it takes a lot longer than expected to sneak out of her bedroom and head off. Unfortunately for her, it seems to have taken her long enough to fall asleep, as she's obviously having the worst nightmare imaginable, having to review a movie that really, really sucks. This brings her back to the crave in Fallout 4 style, where she sees the worst fear of any teenager being stuck working there the rest of her life. If food don't kill you, the service will. <clears throat> oh, you're working part-time, Kruger, huh? 
He reiterates that he feasts on the souls of children, with some visual aids, and demands Alice be a good waitress and bring him a fresh one. Your shift is over. <laughs> so she just has to think of a friend? Kristen had a hell of a time getting her dream power to work in the first place, and Alice can just fucking do it accidentally. Knowing that Debbie's in trouble, she rushes out to find Dan and save her from Freddy. Come on, we have to hurry. What's going on? I'm driving. I'm not, you know, knocking you, but does it really matter who drives? Uh, no idea, but they move out in hopes of reaching Debbie before Kruger can take her out. Come on, we have to hurry. What's going on? I'm driving. The fuck? Is my Blu-ray skipping? Uh, probably not. It's time for Debbie to meet Freddy. No pain. No gain. <laughs> Jesus! God! Uh, yeah, it doesn't really look real, but... Still, it's, uh, yeah. He wasn't just breaking her arms, though. Turns out she is metamorphosizing into the thing she hates the most. A bug. Come on, we have to hurry. I'm driving. You see, now you're just interrupting shit when it's starting to get interesting. With no one there to stop Kruger, we get a pretty wicked-looking nightmare as Debbie continues to shed her flesh and become a giant bug and becomes stuck on an extremely sticky floor she cannot escape. Come on, we have, we have to hurry. hurry. I'm, I'm driving. driving. God, we're both asleep. He's got us going in circles. Well, at least I know that the player's not on the fritz. Somehow they think the best thing they can do is the same shit they've been doing all this time, but strangely this doesn't seem to work. You can check in, but you can't check out. Oh, come on, he turned her into a cockroach. They can survive anything, but not a horror movie sequel? This means Alice gets her soul, too, but no surprise, they're still in the dream world and think running Freddy down will do something. Of course, all it does is make them slam the car into a tree. Alice is fine, but Dan is in trouble. He needs emergency medical care, where the doctors will put him under, for sure. Therefore, Alice must go into the dream world to save him, utilizing all her dead friend's dream powers. Or, at the very least, their character traits, considering they didn't have all that many dream powers this time around. And now that she can truly see herself perfectly clear in the mirror for the first time in forever, it's time to go through the looking glass! You know, I really don't have a problem at all with a Wonderland-inspired character, but don't you think that maybe naming her Alice was a little too on the nose? Being in the dream world with Dan means she's able to help him fight Kruger. Not by fighting Kruger, of course, but merely distracting him as he toys with the kids. Before long, though, he suffers a Back to the Future fade-out from existence. Alice! Alice! You gotta put me back under! You gotta put me back under now! Relax, son. You know you've reached the weird part of A Nightmare on Elm Street when the characters start begging to be put back to sleep. This means that Alice is all alone in the dream world with Freddy Krueger. Welcome to Wonderland, Alice! Yeah, yeah, I get the references, Fred. You don't gotta put a fucking card in your hat for me. The two of them face off against one another, where she utilizes the abilities she has collected throughout the game. Of course, none of them work, so instead, at the last second, she pulls the rest of that Dream Master rhyme out of her ass to defeat him. In the reflection, my mind's eye, evil will see itself. A mirror? A, a fucking mirror was his weakness. Nancy stabbed him in the face with a mirror in the last movie, and it was in a hall of mirrors. What the fuck didn't that do anything? Because they do now. Or maybe a rhyme is some spooky incantation shit. Uh, nevertheless, this weakens Freddy to the point where he can't contain the vast number of children's souls he's collected all this time, and they fight back from within, eventually escaping him completely, upgrading their status from cursed death to just plain old fucking dead. Therefore, happy ending! Kruger is defeated, and more importantly, Alice and Dan got together, stopping by a wishing well to evoke the supernatural one last time. And it really shouldn't surprise her all that much to see a sequel in the future, considering the movie wasn't all that bad. Anyway, that was A Nightmare on Elm Street 4, The Dream Master. And it wasn't all that bad. Oh, yeah.
There's more than a few things I take issue with on the plot, and how it fits into the series as a whole, but overall, things worked out very well. The story continues mostly okay, spared Joey talking with no explanation of if him talking in his dreams made him not mute in the real world somehow, or not, and Kristen's actress being replaced, but Tuesday Night did a good job, so it's hard to fault for that. The issues I had were, while the movie continued directly on the Dream Warrior premise, none of the new characters had dream powers, only the Elm Street kids. Also, while expanding to the new realm of daydreams could have opened a huge section of the world to explore, it didn't really do anything for the plot and was indeed forgotten about halfway through the movie. Of course, the creativity for the kills is admirable, even if at times it gets wonky. It's hard for me to fault the strangeness of the metamorphosis death, when at the same time I admire the effects at work, which throughout the movie are very high quality. Overall, A Nightmare on Elm Street 4, The Dream Master, is a decent follow-up to Dream Warriors, but can't quite capture that movie's thunder, as it drops the ball on several things established in the world last movie, and doesn't deliver completely on things introduced this time around with real potential, but the overall package still manages to entertain, shock, and draw you in, coming in at four steaming hot hunks of soul food out of five. And I will still do feel weird after that one scene, though, but, uh, thank you all for watching, I've been Decker Shadow, and remember... Be extra, extra cautious when lighting your farts. Feeling. We've done this before.